So I want to take a moment to talk about the South. This is, this is my last service here in the South. Next week is going to be in OC, and the week after that is going to be the GLC. How excited is that? And it, it was about six months ago that I came here. And I, I've learned so much from my time here in the South. And I'm very grateful. The, the South has an has a amazing legacy of raising up leaders. And you, you can see the, the different people that have come here and the effect that it's had on them. And I'm, I'm very privileged to be able to be here. Uh, I, I've, I've got to travel to other regions. And God's kingdom is God's kingdom. And, and it's great wherever you go. But there's something special about the South. I, when, when, I, when, when people heard that I was going to be preaching, like, there were so many people that came up to me. Bro, we're, we're behind you, heart and soul. We got your back. We got your support. And, and that unity is precious. That, that encouragement, that love. And I want to really urge you guys to never take it for granted. Never forget what we have here and to truly value that, that, that love, that relationships that we have with one another. So here in my time in the South, I, like I said, I, I've learned a lot. So I've had a lot of people that have poured into me. Um, it's just a shame that Ricky's not here, but I, I really have to really thank him for, for all the things that he's done for me. He's, he's really poured so much into me, and I'm very grateful for, for what he's had. Um, there's... I mean, I'd be up here all day if I was thanking everyone that had invested in me, but I, I, I definitely have to say something for Ricky. <laughs> but, um, so of all the things that I've learned here, um, one thing that I've learned a lot about is failure. And uh, I, I, I think uh, I, I've become a bit of an expert in it if we, 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 we talk about the things that we've come here. And, and I, I came to L.A. with these expectations of like, yeah. L.A. is like the, the big church. L.A. is the church with the leaders, with the singers, with the fancy uh, A.V. in the back, with the live stream, with the, with they got all the great stuff. L.A. is where the crankers go. <laughs> and, and I came here and my, my expectations didn't meet, meet with the, the reality of things. Like, man, like, there's, there's challenges here. This is, this is tough. And, and more so than that, like, I thought, like, L.A. was going to be, like, the cushy church where it's, like, nice, you come, and they're, like, feed you ice cream all day long. And... No, no, no. I got, I got ice cream for a week. And it was like meat and potatoes. It was, it was challenging. It was so, it was like the people got involved in my life and they, uh, they worked on me. They, they didn't leave these issues that I had unresolved. They didn't leave the, the character flaws. They didn't leave the sin, the weaknesses uh, ignored. And they dealt with them. And I'm, I'm so grateful for, for this time here and the, the impact it's had on me. But, but when it comes to failure, people think that failure is a bad thing, and they, they don't want to fail. They, they're like, no, don't fail, no, no, no. But when you look at a lot of, in the, in the world, a lot of the most prominent leaders, they attribute most of their success to their failures. They, they, the, the, you think of someone like, uh, like Elon Musk, one of the, the great visionaries of our time, very amazing inventor. He d designed PayPal, he has Tesla Motors, the SpaceX program, all these great, great things. And I remember watching a, a video of him. Uh, he had this, this vision. He was like, man, I want to put people on Mars. And they're like, you can't do that. That's crazy. It's, like, it's never going to work. He's like, yeah, yeah, let me, let me do it. He's like, what's the first thing I need? Okay, I need a self-landing rocket. He's like, okay, I can do that. Yeah. So he, he, he builds this rocket, and it's, it's a $2 billion investment. And I watched it take off on Facebook. And we see the video of it taking off, and it comes, it flies around, it comes to land, and it goes, land, shh lands, and then it like starts to tip over. <laughs> Boom! And it explodes into a million pieces. And the piece, not like big pieces like this, like little tiny, tiny pieces. And boom, two billion dollars gone like that. And people were like, see, we told you. You failed. It can't be done. And he's like, no, 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 no. Like, now I know what I need to do differently for the next rocket to be successful. And of course he did. He spent another two billion dollars and built another rocket, and it was successful the second time. And so we can, we can see that in the world, but more so, we can see that type of uh, mentality of, of learning from our failures and growing from our failures in the Bible. And this is what I want to share with you about what I've learned from my time here and how my failures have changed me and, and really transformed me as a, as a man and as a disciple. So the title of my lesson today is Transformational Failure. We're, we're going to be looking at a, a people 
that were very good at failing. They did it regularly. And these are the Israelite people. They, we look at their story in the Old Testament, and they were always getting it wrong. And we pick it up in, in the book of Haggai. So for those of you that don't know Haggai, it's, uh, you go to Matthew, you go a few books back. It's a minor prophet. We don't hear about it very often, but the minor prophets are amazing. Haggai is a very short book, but it's very powerful. There's a lot that we can learn from it. And so what's happened here in Haggai is that the people of Israel have rebelled against God. And because of that, God has punished them by being conquered by the Babylonians and taken into exile. And they're in exile for 70 years, and then they return back to Jerusalem. But Jerusalem has been destroyed, absolutely decimated. And the temple of the Lord has been destroyed. It's really cool that, that Stefano shared about this magnificent temple that all the kings and the leaders, they invested all their time, their money, their resources. And it was spectacular. You should go after the sermon, go and look it up in 1 Kings chapter 6. You see just the extravagance of the gold and the giant bronze pillars. And it was truly, truly spectacular. And, and we see what, what's happened here is that um, Ezra was responsible for rebuilding the temple, and he had laid the foundation of the temple. And he'd also rebuilt the altar. And Haggai was with him building this. And in, in Haggai chapter 1, what had happened was is that the people uh, had stopped building. They, they, had, they had got discouraged because they thought like, oh, this, um, this, uh, this temple is it's not going to be as, as good as what, what it is. And so what what God comes and he speaks to them in chapter 2 is where we pick up our story. And in, in verse 1, this is, what, this is what it says. In the second year of King Darius, on the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shethiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Ask them, who is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when I, you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the, sand, or the sea and the dry land, I will shake the nations, and what is desired by all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. So what had happened is that the people had become discouraged and had stopped building because they thought, man, the first temple was great, and this one is not as good. And, and I, I see how we can relate to this so much in ourselves, is that anytime we have something and we fail at it, and then we're given a second opportunity to do it again, we become so easily discouraged. We feel that, oh man, like, I blew it the first time. Like, I couldn't do it the first time, and this next time is going to be even worse than the first time. And that's exactly how the Israelites felt. But what does God come and he says to them? He like shakes them up. He's like, guys, 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 listen to me. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to shake the heavens. I'm going to bring in the nations. I'm going to make this glory of this house more glorious than the former house. And the problem with the Israelites is that they become man focused. They realize like, man, we don't have as much money as we had before. And they thought like, what's the point? It's kind of like if you imagine your grandfather has a $10 million family estate, and it's like all the, the pride and joy of the family, and then it gets destroyed in a fire, and you have nothing. And it's left up to you. You have to rebuild this, but you've only got 100 grand. And it's like, man, like, how am I supposed to do this? this there's no way that this is going to be as good as the one before because I don't have the money. I don't have the time. I don't have the people. I don't have whatever it is that you're lacking. But God is saying, like, guys, don't be man-focused. You don't understand where the glory comes from. The glory comes from me. I'm the one that's going to shake the heavens and the earth. I'm the one that's going to shake the nations and bring the glory into the house. I'm going to one that's make this more glorious than the first time. And this is what we need to realize for ourselves, is that when we see ourselves coming up short, when we see ourselves failing, we need to have faith that God's going to work through us, that God's going to transform us to bring about a more glorious result the second time around than the first time. So when I, when I think of myself, I, I came here, and uh, you guys will remember what I was like when I came here. I was qu quite a different person. And I, 
I made a lot of failures. Like I, I got a lot of stuff wrong. In fact, I, I, I probably got like, everything wrong. Like across the board, I got it all wrong. And you guys remember what it was like. I was, I was prideful. I was selfish. I was, uh, I was uh, unloving. I was, I was lazy. I was, had all of these sins in my heart that I had dealt with. And because of that, I was, I was struggling in so many ways. And I remember the I, I, first place I went to was, was Cal State Long Beach. And it's a, go beach, yeah. And it's, Cal State Long Beach is an incredible university. It's great. The people there are talented. They're intelligent. They're hardworking. And I was like, yeah, this is going to be perfect. This is where I get to like show how awesome I am. I'm going to like double this one like in a month. It's going to be great. And I, I, and I, I was full of all this zeal without knowledge, but I, I just was going for it. And, and I, I, I caused a lot of friction, conflict, problems. And it, it, was, it was difficult. So a lot of people kind of suffered from because of me. The people at Cal State, they, it's, yeah, you don't just affect you. But when you fail as a leader, you affect the people around you. And uh, the people were very much affected. I think the, the person that probably suffered the most was poor Devin. She was my co-leader. And she had a rough go of it. Like, man, I, I made it her life hard. And I wish she was here. I could apologize to her in the sermon. But <laughs> it, was, it was tough. And uh, I got a lot, a lot of stuff wrong. And by God's grace, I, I got moved from, from Cal State Long Beach onto LBCC. <laughs> Boom! And LBCC was great. And I, I, I was like, this is my second opportunity. And, and Ricky, it was like, I didn't deserve to move because, I, like I said, I got everything wrong the first time. But he's like, hey, this is another chance for you to, to try again. And I was like, uh, I was like okay, I gotta really got to repent of my sin. i got to change. And things, things started getting better. And I was leading with Heidi, and uh, Heidi's awesome. And I, I was like, I would go to her, and I was like, we were leading a few weeks, and I was like, Heidi, so like, how am I doing? She's like, oh, you're doing good. Like, no, 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 like, Heidi, tell me really, how am I doing? <laughs> and she's like, no, 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 you're doing good. Like, like, I mean, I talked with Devin before when you were at Cal State, and she was telling me about you were struggling and stuff, but like, obviously, you changed. Like, the things you were doing there, you're not doing now. So, yeah, it's, it's, things are working better. She's like, man, I guess you just had to get everything out of your system. You had, to, you had to do all your failing at Cal State, so that way you could finally get it right at LBCC. And at LBCC, we had amazing victories. We had so many great things with Keenan and Angel. And then we had a miracle in the form of Candy. She got baptized, and she's here. And Candy is just a ray of sunshine. She comes in, she lifts people's spirits. She's got an awesome visitor here today. She's amazing. And uh, I'm, I'm so glad that, that God was able to, to work despite my failures of the first time to bring about a much more glorious, much more success the second time. And so with, with all of this, I want to challenge you guys and ask you this question, is that in your life, what's the area that you are faithless in? What's the area that you have failed in before and you think that God cannot overcome? You've made a mistake and you can't get it right the second time. I want to challenge you to really repent of that faithlessness, to really believe that God is the God of everything, that God is bigger than your failures, and God is able to work through you and to overcome your failures. But to do that, you have to have faith in God. So that's my challenge for you, the first one. So we, we see that um, we, we fail in different ways and things, and there are lots of reasons why we might fail. But, but one reason that will guarantee our failure every single time is sin. We will always sin. Be, we will always fail because of sin. And so my second point that I want to talk to you about is doomed to failure. Because when we are in sin, we are doomed to failure. There's nothing is going to go right when we're in sin. And we see this very clearly in God's word. And so as we continue in verse 12, we see what, what God says some more to the people. It says this. If someone carries consecrated meat in the fold of their garment, and that fold touches some bread or stew, some wine, some olive oil, or other food, does it become consecrated? The priest answered, no. Then Haggai said, if a person defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of these things, does it become defiled? Yes, the priest replied, it becomes defiled. Then Haggai said, so it is with these people and this nation in my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they do, whatever they offer, there is defiled. Now give careful thought from this day on. Consider how things were before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. When anyone came to heap of 20 measures, there were only 10. When anyone went to wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were only 20. 
I struck all the work of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. From this day on, from the 24th day of the ninth month, give careful thought to the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Give careful thought. Is there yet any seed left in the barn? Until now, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not borne fruit. So we see God is rebuking the people of Israel. And what is the problem? He uses this this illustration for them. And he says, like, look, if, if someone takes consecrated meat and touches it, something else doesn't make it consecrated. Now, what does consecrated mean? It means set apart. It's like we have bread and we have consecrated bread. And the consecrated bread was set apart for the Lord's temple. It was holy. It was special. And it had to be blessed to make it consecrated. And just because you took it and you spread it or whatever didn't make other things consecrated. But if a person was defiled, what did that mean? That meant the person was ritually unclean. They were unacceptable to God and could not enter into God's presence. And you could do that from a variety of ways. Um, In this example, it's by touching a dead body. And what happens, though, if you are defiled and you touch other things, they also become defiled. And what do we see here? Is that your sin spreads to other people. When, you, when you're living in sin, the people around you are going to be, they're going to catch that. It's contagious. And they're going to be affected by this. And we see that God says the most intense, harsh thing right here. He says in verse 14, so it is with this people. He doesn't even say my people, this people. He's saying these people don't belong to me and this nation in my sight. Whatever they do and whatever they offer there is defiled. So what is taking place here? We see the people are coming to the Lord's temple to offer sacrifices. And they're offering these sacrifices on the altar. They think they're doing the right thing. They're like, God, we're doing the right thing. We laid the foundation. We built the altar. We're coming to you for sacrifices. But God says, no, that's not what I want. I didn't tell you to give me sacrifices. I told you to rebuild my temple. And they had not obeyed him because they had decided in their mind, we've obeyed God enough. We don't have to fully obey what he's told us to do. And God has said, that's not okay. That's not acceptable. And this is what is so important for us to understand, that we don't get to decide how much we obey God. God gives us commands, and we must obey them entirely. Because what happens if we don't? God will turn against us. And this is a terrifying, terrifying thing. Because the, the world, it says that Satan has crafted this ingenious lie. It's so crafty, so deceptive. And it's based primarily on truth. And so what it says is that God is all-powerful. True. God is all-loving. True. God loves me and wants to bless me. True. Because God is all-powerful, because God is all-loving, because God wants to bless me, he will only do good things for me. And if bad things are happening to me, it's obviously not from God. And, and as if we, can, we can forget about this, but this is not what the Bible says. He says in verse 17, I, that's God, I struck all the work of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail. What is blight? Blight ruins your food. It, what is uh, mildew? It ruins your clothes. What is hail? It ruins everything else. So <laughs> God is saying, look, I've destroyed everything in your world. Why? Is it because God's just cruel? He just likes to kick people for fun and make their lives harsh or whatever? He says, no, yet you did not return to me. And we see so clearly, what does sin do? It destroys. Everywhere it goes, it destroys people's lives. And when we have sin in our life, it destroys our life. And God is saying, like, listen, I'm trying to save you. You're trying to, your life is a mess. And I'm trying to save you. I'm calling you back to me and you're not listening. Please come back because that's how God loves us. God allows or sometimes even causes bad things to happen in our life because he loves us, because he wants us to repent and to return to him. And, and this, is, this is what we, we see that, that God, he does not bless sin, which is, which is good because it would be bad if he did. Imagine what would happen if you're in sin and then good things happen to you. What are you going to do? You're going to want to sin all the more. It's like, man, this is, this is good. Like, I, I like stealing. Man, I get to make more money. I, my life is great. I'm getting a promotion. This is awesome. All you're going to do is become more corrupt, more wicked. Whereas if you steal and you get caught and you go to jail, you're going to repent. And you're like, man, I'm never stealing again. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to, be, uh, I'm going to obey God's word. And so um, when, when I, I look at my own failure, 
uh, it's, I mean, it's very obvious the sin that I had, but um, when I was at Cal State, um, we, we talked about like me getting it wrong. And I, I, I can really relate to the Israelites here when it says in verse 16, when anyone came to a heap of 20 measures, there were only 10. When anyone came to a wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were only 20. So I would show up, fired up, ready to go at Cal State. All right, I got some studies. I got some Bible talk. I got some this. I got some that. And I show up and I was like, all right, so uh, with the, 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 the studies, the, the, the wine, like we, I got it, 50 gallons, ready to go? Oh, bro, like there's only 20. 20? What, what happened to the rest? I, was like, I, I don't know. I was supposed to be 50, but there's only 20. Amen. Okay, but I, I, I got the grain over here. That 20 mounds of grain is like, there's only 10? 10 mounds of grain? What happened to that rest? What, what's going on? And I couldn't figure it out because in my mind, I was doing everything right. I was sharing my faith. I was having my quiet times. I was praying. I was discipling people. I was living a great life. Everything was great. And everything should have been working out. In, in my mind, I couldn't compute why, was things not happen- why were things not happening the way they were supposed to happen. And it, it wasn't until I had a, a D time with the Kernans that it, it all kind of crystallized. And so, so what, what was happening, Rebecca and I, when we started dating, uh, the Kernans were, were giving us advice for, for the dating relationship. And anyone that's dating or wants to be dating, get lots of advice. It, it helps a lot. And, and so we, we started off, and we'd get together once a month. And we would come in the first time, it was great. We opened up in Genesis, Garden of Eden, some really cool nuggets, practical application. It was great. It's like, all right, awesome. Second time, it's like, this is great. Awesome, look at this, look at that. Learned so much. Third time, this is, this is in March. And we go, and, <laughs> and Timmy starts off. And he, he starts with Rebecca. And he's like, Rebecca, you are amazing, sis. Oh, man, leading the IE region. You're doing your master's. I'm so proud out of you with Kip, you're amazing, says, says you're awesome. And he turns to me. <laughs> and Tim reaches into his, his, his bag and pulls out his metaphorical hammer. And metaphorically, for the next hour and a half, I kid you not, I timed it, he broke every bone in my body. He picked me apart piece by peace. And I was just sitting just in shock. I just had no idea what happened. Like, as Tim said, I didn't know if it was Tuesday or March. Like, I didn't know what, what was happening. And, and, and Timmy, he took, he took a bit of a break, and he, like halfway through, he took a pause, and he's like, bro, like, I'm actually impressed. I don't even know what he's going to say. <laughs> and he's like, you, you've actually you've done a great job in, in uniting the South. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, you've united them in a common purpose against you <laughs> and, <laughs> and he's like yeah like like bro like yeah they're, they're home right now and, and I, I know they're they're sharpening their pitchforks and then they're, they're, they're lighting their torches to come after you <laughs> and and I'm just sitting there I just no idea what's going on Rebecca's just sitting there like smiling like it's okay <laughs> and and t- Tim he really he really like made it clear for me. I was like, I was trying to understand. I was like, but Tim, like, I'm doing everything right. I don't understand what, what you're talking about. And he's like, bro, you're right. What you're saying is right. What you're doing is right. But because of your heart, because of the sin in your heart, you're wrong. So you can tell someone 100% the truth. But if you do it without love, you're wrong. And God's not going to bless that. And so I had to go after some radical repentance. I had, my heart had become so hardened and so, so seeped in pride that I had to go and I had to fast and fast for days and days and days. And it was only when I got so hungry that I was like, okay, God, please, I'll repent. <laughs> and I, 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 I was really convicted because the thing that got me to repent was, was food. And that's how I saw how wicked I was because I realized, like, man, if I loved people half as much as I love food, I would not have this problem. And, and it was... It was, it was such an important moment for me because it coincided with my, my transfer to uh, LBCC. It happened at, a, at the exact same time. And the people at Cal State and the people at LBCC could see such a change in myself, in my, my attitude, in my character, but also in the results. 
the things that I had, God blessed me far more at LBCC than he did at Cal State because, <laughs> God blessed me because of my repentance, because repentance is refreshing. And so my, my question for you guys is, what is the area that you are consistently failing in? Therefore, what is the sin in your life that's causing you to fail in that area? What do you need to go after the radical repentance so that you can change and that God will bless you so that you can accomplish your goals and your dreams and your, your aspirations and God can be with you? My third and final point is this, secure in failure. So all of us have sin, amen? So that means that all of us will fail, guaranteed. And so, but we need to, we need to rethink of how we, how we view failure because we see failure as such a bad thing. We don't want to fail. And what that comes from is a deep, deep insecurity. And when, we, when people, they get their security from, from the world. And in the world, your value is based upon your performance. And so if you perform well, you are valuable. But if you do not perform well, you are not valuable. So uh, naturally, I mean, our value can change from day to day. And so we have, we, it's understandable we'd have an insecurity about that. Like, man, like, yesterday my friends liked me, but today I don't know if they will. And so in order for us to be secure in failure, we really have to, have to look at what, what God says about us and God says about our failure. And we, we continue in, at the end of Haggai. And so God has just rebuked them just intensely. But that's not where it ends. This isn't where the final word from the Lord. And it says in verse 20, the word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time. Amen. On the 24th day of the ninth month. Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, that I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones. I will shatter the power of the foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers. Horses and their riders will fall, each by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shethiel, declares the Lord, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. So what we see here is that God begins by stating who he is. I am God. I am in control of everything. I raise up kingdoms and I destroy empires. I overthrow armies. I am in control of everything. And because of that, I'm going to tell you something. and You better listen. And what he says is that, Zerubbabel, I have chosen you. You are my servant. And what he says here, he says, I, I will make you like my signet ring. Now, for those of you that don't know, a signet ring, is, it comes originally from kings. And a king would have a signet ring. And what that was is that represented his authority. That would officiate a document. Anytime he would issue like a law or a decree, he would seal it with his ring, press it into the wax, and it would leave his mark. And it was like a signature. And the, the ring represented everything with the king. It was his identity. It was his power, his authority. And then this grew to uh, not just kings, but, but powerful families. And the ring would be the family ring. And you would have the fathers and the sons. They would all have the same ring. And it would, it would represent their identity. And I, I love the story of prodigal, the prodigal son, like Rebecca shared, because when we see the son returning, he's given what? He's given a ring. The ring represented his identity. Yeah, he had a robe because he didn't have clothes. Yeah, he had shoes because he didn't have shoes. But the ring... That's what said, you are now not a servant. You are my son. And we see that this is what God is saying, is that, look, I'm giving you my identity. I'm giving you my power, my authority to follow and to obey my commands and to be my servant. And, and people can think, like, okay, yeah, Old Testament, he's, talking, he's not talking to Israel here. Like, all this other stuff, he's talking to Israel, but this he's only talking to Zerubbabel. But we know that God is the same in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so after Jesus comes... Let's see, what you, let's see what the Bible has to say in Ephesians chapter 1. And we see what God has to say in chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Paul says this to the Ephesian church, reminding them of something that they, they've forgotten. Praise be to the Lord and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him 
before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. So we see that now because of Jesus, because of his death on the cross, now we can have a relationship with God. Now we're no longer defiled. Now we have a relationship and we are brought into adoption. Now, how does adoption work? When you go to uh, an adoption center, the parents come, do the children get to choose their parents? No, of course not. The parents come, they look at all the children and they say, I want that one. I want that one, I want that one. They're going to become a part of my family. I've chosen them. And of course, they're, they, they don't know, like, they don't look at the, oh yeah, tell me about their, their history. What, what are they like? What are they this or that? No, they choose them regardless. And this is exactly the same with us. God has chosen each of us regardless of who we were, regardless of our past failures. He's chosen us and accepted us. And we see it gets even more than that because how, how deep does this go? He says he's chosen us before the creation of the world. How, like, that just blows my mind. How's that even? That doesn't make sense, but the Bible says it, so it must be true. And, <laughs> like, God has chosen us, and he, he, we see in all these other promises about how he wants to bless us. Even Paul reminds us here, he has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. Because that's how God sees us. He wants to bless. He wants to do good things to us. And for us to truly be, ex be able to accept our failures, we have to have our security in God. We have to understand how he sees us. Because only then that our failures won't matter to us. So uh, as a child, I was very privileged. I, I had the best childhood. I had, my dad is here. And... I, I love it when my dad comes to church because I get to introduce him to all of my friends. And I was introducing him to Candy, and I was saying, like, here's my dad. He's awesome, everything. I was like, like, some people say they've got the best dad. And I understand why they would think that, but they're wrong. Like, I've got the best dad. And it's true. Like, my dad has always been there for me. He's always, he's, he's taught me so much. I've learned so much from him about people, about understanding uh, cultures, about learning about so many things and also my mom she, she's not able to be here but so much of who I am is from my mother she, she was always there for me she always had my back my parents always loved and supported me and and my because of my parents they they traveled all over the world as, as missionaries and I got I got to live everywhere I got to, I was born in America I got to live in America I got to move to Ireland I got to go to Indonesia and life was a big adventure it was fantastic. Everywhere I go, great things are happening. It's wonderful. And uh, in university, I studied anthropology. And it's all about culture and learning about different peoples. And when you go to different countries, they have different ways of thinking. So for example, if you imagine in America, they think like a circle. In Ireland, they think like a square. In Indonesia, they think like a triangle. And it's, it's not right or wrong. It's just a different way of thinking. And anyone that's traveled abroad will understand the, the culture shock that you might, you might face. And so, but, but it's, 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 as an adult, it's okay. Because you, you grew up your whole life in America. You're a circle. I'm okay, I'm a circle. You go to Ireland, they're squares. Okay, amen, whatever, it's fine. But as a child, it was very difficult for me. Because I was always trying to find who I was. And if I were to compare myself to a shape, I would have been like a pentagon. And so what are pentagons? They're, they're awkward. They're like five sides. Like, what is that? And, <laughs> and, and you, I, like, I would go somewhere, and I, I would be in America. It's like the circles. And a pentagon, if you look at it, it's kind of close to a circle. It's almost like it. And, but it's not, it's not there. It's not it. Or, or you go to, to Ireland, it's a square. It's like, hey, it's almost a square. You just got this little extra stuff. Or Indonesia, it's, it's quite different from a triangle. But, but uh, I, I always found myself either being described as too much or not enough. And, and the challenge for me as a, as a child was I always wanted to be accepted by the group that I was a part of. And like, I, we, we moved so much. 
And there was, every time I would move, like there would always be this, this new group of people. And it would always be a different set of standards. So I was like, hey, we're, here were circles. Every, we love circles. Oh, over there were squares. No, we don't like circles. We, want, we like squares. So it's always this different standard. I, I, can never, I can never meet up to people's expectations. And, and that was really hard. And I, what I did to, to protect myself was I hardened my heart. And I wrapped it up with, with pride. I was like, man, like, I, I, don't, I don't care what you think of me. I don't, I don't, I don't need anybody. Like, I, I'm, I'm me. I'm awesome. I'm this. I'm that. I, I, don't, I don't need anyone's approval. And, but secretly, I desperately wanted it. I desperately wanted to be accepted by the people. And uh, this, this is what got me through my adult life. I, I went back to Ireland and was so, so prideful, so hardened, so intellectual. And I, um, it, just, it got me through. I, I survived, barely. But um, then, I, then I became a disciple. And God started working on me. He started changing me. And I, I couldn't have a hard heart anymore. I, I had, God started softening my heart. And I, I, I couldn't be prideful. God started taking away the, the layers of pride. But what that was, it was, a, it was a protective blanket around my heart. And, and he started working on that. And then it was December time came. And then it came time to, to move to L.A. And um, I came here starting to feel very insecure about a lot of things and feeling like I had to prove myself. So I remember coming to uh, the first staff meeting, and I said, this is Colby, and he's Rebecca's boyfriend. <laughs> and that, that hurt my pride so much. It was like, no, I'm, I'm nobody's anything. Don't tell me that I'm somebody something else. I'm me, and me's good enough. And it, was, and it, it, it made me so angry, so, so hurt, because that's what I've always been described as someone else's something. And, and w what happened was is that, that because of my heart was, was softening, because of the pride was being peeled back layer and layer, it, it exposed my insecurities. There was nothing to hide them anymore. And, and it, it, it made things so hard. That's, that's why I was so prideful at Cal State. Like, I, I had to prove myself. Like, oh, let me, let me show you how, how good I am. Don't you know who I am? I'm Colby. I'm the talented one. I'm, I'm the valuable one. Because my whole life, I'd always been searching for, for value from other people. And I had never, never gotten that. And it, it, this continued my entire time here. And it, it came to be about June time. And we handed over LBCC to, to Caleb and Liz. And then um, I was like, man, well, now I've got to get ready for London. And there's just this, this huge wave of like, fear came over, to, came over me. Because like, man, I'm supposed to go to, to the London church. And I'm supposed to be like, leading. I, I can't do that. I'm not good enough. I'm not, I'm not the leader that I'm supposed to be. Like, I know what the expectations are, and I know that I don't match up to those. Like, man, I'm supposed to be leading with Rebecca, but I, I don't even know how things are going to work with us, what's going to happen. I, I just, I don't know. And I, I was struggling so much with this. And it was God, he crashed into my life. He said, Colby, stop. Just stop. Just listen to what I have to say to you. I am the God of everything. You traveled the world, I made the world. You, you saw mountains and valleys, I made the mountains, I made the valleys, I made the oceans and the rivers and the streams and everything. And I made you. And this is what I have to say about you. You're my son. You are valuable to me. You are good enough for me. And that, that, for the first time in my life, that really impacted my heart. Because I, I studied the Bible before. I grew up very religious. And like, I, I read Ephesians. I, I spent a semester in Bible college studying Ephesians. I could have told you the Greek. I could have told you the back culture, the everything about it. But it, it never had any power on my heart. And for the first time, I really understood what it meant to be adopted by God. And, and as it, this was about, about two weeks ago. It's very new for me. And I was just coming as I'm reflecting on, on all of my, my past failures here. And I, I, was, I had a piece about them. Like, okay, like, yeah, I, I, I did a lot of stuff wrong. I, got a lot, I made a lot of mistakes. But because God loves me, that's okay. It's okay when I get it wrong. Because my value to God is not based on my performance.
<laughs> With that being said, I have to ask you, where is your security found? Because looking at, looking at the, the world, we see that people find their security in so many places. We see that they look for it in maybe their education or their friendship network or, or their job or their money or, or their relationships or, or whatever it may be. And that's where I was looking for, for it for. I was looking for it in my, my position in the church. I'm a leader. I Bible talk this and that. I, I have my girlfriend, this and that. I, I was looking for it for all these other places. And it was, it was inadequate. It wasn't good enough. And the world is not good enough. The world does not give us that ultimate fulfillment and security that we're longing for, that we need. And so my challenge for you is, is that if you do not have that security in God, if you do not have that unshakable foundation of, I am a son of God, I am a daughter of God. And who is God? God is a king. So what does that make us? Princes and princesses. Yeah. And I, I want to challenge you to study the Bible, to understand what it means to be chosen by God, to what it means to be loved, to be accepted by God. And, and maybe you, you've studied this already before, but didn't quite get it the first time. Hey, that's okay. This is a sermon all about failures. We know that we get it right the second time. Amen? And so study the Bible to understand how God sees you because God is the only one that matters. My time here in the South has been amazing. I, I've built some incredible friendships. I've learned so much. I've changed so much as a person. Like people, people in London are going to see me. They're like, what do they do to you in L.A.? <laughs> because I'm a different person. And it's because of you guys. And this is, this is my final thing that I want to leave you with. Is um, when, we, when we look at our lives, we must have our ultimate security in God. And from that security, we must look at our lives and be radical about our repentance. We must truly turn our way to follow God in total obedience so that God will bless us. And last of all, when we fail, we must understand that God's still in control and that God will work through us. God will work despite our failures to bring about a more glorious result the second time around. To the South region, I love you very much and to God be all the glory. Yeah.